the world's most honored watch is Longines. Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnall Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnall, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Mr. Elliot Haynes, an editor of United Nations World, and Mr. Henry Hazlitt, editor of The Freeman and contributing editor of Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Dr. Lyle J. Hayden, formerly chief of the agricultural section of ECA and presently program director of the Near East Foundation. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speaker. Dr. Hayden, you've just returned from mm -hmm. Iran. I'd like to know what the Near East Foundation has been doing lately there. The Near East Foundation is engaged in a program of rural improvement. And our uh, objective is to improve the standard of living among the peasants in rural Iran. We hope to uh, do this in the form of a demonstration which will be <coughs> accepted and uh, put into practice by not only the Iranian government, but the peasants themselves. I suppose it ought to make clear, though, that the uh, Near East Foundation is a private organization, private philanthropic or organization, has nothing to do with ECA. That is right. It's yes. a private organization spon sponsored by uh, individual contributions, and it has as its motto to help the people help themselves through greater learning. Could you give us some idea, Dr. Hayden, of uh, who those contributors are? Well, for the most part, they're people without a great deal of money, I judge. I don't uh -huh. know who they are, but the average contribution runs around 10 or $12. So this is more or less the, the common people of America helping the common people of Iran. That's the mm -hmm. nice thing about our program. What sort of relation would your program have to point four? I don't mean whether it has any formal relationship, but I mean how does it compare and what it does or tries to do? Perhaps you should say what uh, relationship does point four have to our program? Well, that's all right. Because Fine. we were going before <laughs> point four, before point four was inaugurated. But uh, actually, uh, it's to accomplish the same thing. We're both trying to help the backward peoples of the world help themselves. Could you give us some idea, Dr. Hayden, of just how backward Iran is? Say, for example, what their agricultural methods are. The average uh, Iranian peasant farmer has uh, a wooden plow. He has a float, that is a drag about eight feet long, which he sticks the point of the plow in. And perhaps he has a half interest in an ox. And outside of that, he has nothing but hand tools. And that uh, requires an awful lot of correction, I imagine, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It means that with these very crude implements, he can only handle about uh, seven and a half to as much as 15 acres. That's all the land he can physically get over during the short growing season that they have available. Does it? Well, I'd like to bring up a question of this nature. Uh, a lot of people think, a lot of businessmen who've come back from uh, the so-called underdeveloped countries say that the chief need of those countries is private risk capital, private foreign risk capital. And that when this uh, money is handed out, let's say under point for ECA or out of the United States government, then these countries, the governments of these countries, won't do the things that are necessary to attract foreign capital, to make their countries attractive to foreign capital, and that until they do that, they won't be developed. And I'd like to have you speak to that point. That is a di very difficult point. And I think it's due to the fact that many of these governments, many of the governments of these backward areas, are relatively unstable themselves. Until uh, the nationals of a country who have wealth are willing to invest in that country's resources, you can hardly ask a foreigner to send money in. But don't, doesn't the government have to make uh, conditions attractive for the domestic investor before it's likely to make them attractive for the foreign investor? 
That's true. It should make it attractive for the uh, domestic investor. And I think that most countries are trying to do that. They're, they've made considerable progress in that respect. Well, Dr. Hayden, getting back to Iran for a second, uh, I understand that no matter how much technical assistance of the type that your foundation renders to uh, foreign countries, that the, they do need a certain amount of the type of capital that uh, Mr. Hazlitt mentioned. And Iran especially needs a resumption of her oil revenues that she lost recently. Would you concur in that? Yes, very definitely. It seems as though Iran is almost on the verge of bankruptcy. Well, I don't know where they'll get uh, foreign uh, exchange unless they can sell their oil. Well, now, do you think that there's a possibility that the British and the Iranians will patch up their differences? I don't think so. But do you think there's any likelihood of a settlement through this World Bank arrangement that's been spoken of? I think that's the most uh, hopeful uh, type of solution that has been suggested so far. Do you think there's any real possibility of its being acceptable both to the British and to the Iranians? I think it is, yes. I think that probably uh, some type of arrangement like that, perhaps with uh, modifications, is about the only solution that I can see. I understand that the loss of oil to the West has already been made up in other areas of the Near East, though, so that it's actually just a question of Iran's uh, welfare. That's right. That's unfortunate from Iran's point of view. Well, just how important is Iran to the, to the West in that case? Well, I consider it is very important because uh, there is a great reserve of oil in that area, and we are interested in uh, the oil reserves. And if Iran should uh, uh, go through a revolution, if uh, some foreign power should take over control of Iran, it's quite conceivable that they could easily take over control of all the rest of the oil producing area around the uh, uh, Persian Gulf. And that area produces or has as a potential reserve some 40 or 60 percent of the world's reserve oil supply. Which might be needed sometime. Which might be needed sometime indeed. Well, do you think we've been following a very good policy in the Near East? You or mean foreign our, policy? our foreign policy? Uh, perhaps I might ask that, answer that question by asking one as the typical Arab might. And that would be to say, what is our foreign policy in the Near East? The Arabs what puzzles the, the Arab about that? It seems that we have uh, one time uh, followed one course of action and another time uh, followed another. We have told the Arab that we were their friends and that we wanted to help them. And then we seem to help the uh, countries or country that was uh, taking their territory away from them. At least they were afraid that they would see that as a reason. Well, does the Arab make any comparison between our treatment of, uh, of them and our treatment, let's say, of, of Israel? Very definitely so. In the recent uh, allotment of funds under TCA, the Arab has said, well, uh, you are giving $50 million to 4 million people and $50 million to 40 million people, and we are the 40 million. And we think that's not an, an, an equitable distribution of this aid. Well, coming back to the work of the uh, Near East Foundation, uh, just what would be a typical project? What would be a typical concrete project that you've been doing lately? Well, I, uh, one of the things that we have done is to uh, encourage farmers to improve their poultry breeds. And just recently, when I was in Iran the last time, uh, I was privileged to observe an exchange of improved birds. In fact, they were very nice barred rock roosters for those that the villagers raised. Our poultrymen went to the village with enough roosters to exchange one nice rooster for every native rooster they had. An interesting thing happened there. These uh, children and uh, ladies and men were bringing their roosters up. And uh, I saw one woman that had a very small rooster. And pretty soon I looked around and she was not there. Then before the end of the line reached the truck, she was back, but she had two, the small rooster and a small hen. When they asked her why she was bringing the hen, she said, I, my chicken was so small that I thought I'd have to give two of one of these nice ones. Do you think, Dr. Hayden, that uh, the absentee land uh, owner problem in Iran is, is uh, one that has to be solved? Yes, I think that type of uh, uh, land tenure system must be solved and must be improved eventually. Is that done by educating the landowner or, uh, or by putting political pressure on him or how? Uh, you've stated it in a very nice way, educating the landowner to show him that it's necessary for this land reform to come about. In other words, 
that he must uh, take more interest in his peasants, help them, and share a greater amount of the wealth with them. You think that uh, you can do that, that they will listen to you? Of course, not all of them, but there are many uh, landowners who are quite willing to improve the lot of their people. They know that that's simply good insurance. Mm -hmm. They must do that. Dr. Hayden, I'd like to switch to uh, Europe for a second and ask you something about your ECA experiences. Uh, do you believe that the, our policy mm -hmm. of, um, was well handled in giving the vast sums we did to Europe in 1948 and 9? I think that very definitely we were doing the right thing by providing economic aid to Europe. Perhaps I would agree with Senator Taft when I say, when he said uh, that uh, he believed in foreign aid, but not so much. I think I agree. That that's well, my Dr. Position. Hayden, as a final question, I'd like to ask you, what do you think is the most important thing that America need, needs to do in the Near East today? I think the most important thing is to get the confidence of the Near East uh, people. We need to help them uh, straightforwardly and honestly to improve their lot. I think that the, by technical assistance, American know-how, with Americans going in and working with them at the grassroots level is the best single thing we can do. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Hayden, for being with us tonight. Thank you. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. Elliot Haynes and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest was Dr. Lyle J. Hayden, Program Director of the Near East Foundation. You know, there are many fine watches made in the world, but in my travels, I've never found one that inspired the same degree of pride of ownership as Longines, the world's most honored watch. Yes, a Longines watch brings its owner more than beauty, more than thoroughly reliable timekeeping. It brings him the pleasure of knowing that he owns the watch of the highest prestige among the world's finest timepieces. Longines alone, has won 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes and 28 Gold Medal Awards. No watch has a more brilliant record of accomplishment in the world's great government observatories. And in fields of precise timing, sports, aviation, and science, the standing of the Longines watch is unsurpassed. Yes, when you own a Longines watch, you cannot help but be conscious that it is, in fact, the world's most honored watch. When next you buy a watch, either for yourself or as a gift, remember this. If you pay $71.50 or more for a watch, you are paying the price of a Longine. So why not insist on getting a Longine, the world's most honored watch, premier product of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company since 1866 maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines watches are sold from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network.